Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Take the Hill, which is a leadership podcast designed to connect you with influential members of different industries who are knowledgeable and exhibiting great leadership within their respective fields. Today, we are lucky to have with us Professor Sandy Mervosh, who is Assistant Professor and Program Director of the Human Resources Management Program in the Roland School of Business. And we also have Dr. Dennis Ferkatich, who is Assistant Professor in the Department of Employment and Labor Relations at IUP. So thank you both for being here with us today. Well, thank you for thank having you, us. Yes, it's exciting. I'm, and I think I'm used to being here. <laughs> you are. <laughs> You're just changing your roles a little bit today. So, yeah. And I get to play the host, which is a little bit exciting. So, But we are here today, again, just to kind of start looking forward, um, you know, in terms of our planning, you know, over the last few months we've been planning and coming up with strategic plans. Now it's really time to find a way to maybe start to think about operationalizing some of those plans and really looking forward to, you know, the things we need to do as an organization, departments, or even individuals, especially from the HR lens, uh, as we kind of somewhat begin to emerge from the last few months. And our conversation is gonna really focus on three things today, which is communication, looking at the administrative aspects and then leadership. And we're gonna kind of bounce some questions off both Sandy and Dennis uh, to get their insight. And hopefully, like you said, some of that will be relevant to you and your organizations uh, as you begin to kind of move forward. So we'll begin with Sandy. So as you think about you know, communication within organizations, you know, what's, what are some of the really important factors that you know, HR departments really need to be thinking about you know, as you move forward? Right now, especially what we're experiencing um, in all of our, you know, environments and worlds right now, communication is key. And we need to keep in mind that what we're communicating is really critical information. So therefore, it needs to be communicated on multiple channels. Um, everyone has a preferred method of communication. So you can't just rely on one channel for communication when we're talking about returning to work or information regarding the pandemic. We need to use multiple channels. We need to communicate with individuals multiple times. Um, and we also uh, need to make sure that there is consistency in that message. So communication is one of the key elements. You know, once again, multiple channels, um, consistency in the message, we also need in that communication for there to be a clear path for people to ask questions and clarify the communication. And you always have to keep in the back of your mind that everyone's an individual. They respond to communication differently. They have a different path that is better for them. And we wanna make sure that we're not limiting any of that communication to a particular population. Now, when you refer to multiple channels of communication, yes. What are some examples of those for individuals who might necessarily only use, like say, just email, and they consider that to be a channel? How, what other channels are yeah. available? Yeah, that, that's actually, a, a, what you brought up is the really current problem. Everyone overuses email. And especially since we've all been working from home, we are just, you know, overwhelmed with the emails and virtual meetings. So you may want to consider, um, you know, such as posting on a internal portal for your employees. You might want to also consider um, defaulting to the old traditional written mail information, mailing return to work policies to your employees. Uh, and you may also want to uh, start using some social media. Uh, to communicate that information. So it needs to come out in multiple channels. And depending on the critical nature and the target audience for that communication, you may even want to consider actually picking up a telephone <laughs> and talking to those individuals personally about, you know, special return conditions. Yeah. Dennis, your thoughts on kind of, again, the adoption of these multiple channels. And I'm also thinking along the lines of, in terms of the two-way communication, not just going out, but also creating channels that come back in. And your thoughts on that? Well, I'd have to agree with almost with everything. I mean, I would agree with everything that Sandy said. And um, I don't know if I could add a whole lot more, but I think what I would add is what to communicate. Um, I think that's what's important is that uh, 
organizations start looking at what do they need to communicate because you know there's a lot of fears out there a lot of people are afraid to go back to work and i think some of the things that we would need to consider uh, a lot of these organizations are coming up with new policies and procedures that most people aren't aware of so i think they need to communicate with individuals what are those new policies what are those new procedures how is it going to impact their positions their um, their daily life at work because you know a lot of people show up to work and they're there for eight, 10 hours. And uh, it's really looking different on how that's going to be um, done. Also, I think that they need to educate individuals uh, in regards to the fears they may have. Um, uh, again, what are, not a lot of people are up to what is COVID. How does it impact um, the individual? What are, how is it, um, you know, what, what are companies do to keep uh, their employees safe? So they need to communicate to individuals, how are we keeping you safe? What are we doing to make sure that, you know, that this doesn't uh, uh, get passed around amongst employees and, and so forth? Because again, everybody, there's a lot of people that are just afraid to go back to work and, and they have fears. And I think that I have an example, my son, he works in an industry where it's, um, uh, a factory and a lot of people are quitting because they don't want to wear the mask all day. They don't want to, um, they just, they, they don't feel comfortable with everything that the company is doing. And we're seeing companies are having a lot of turnover because of these results. So I think that companies need to take into consideration and communicate and put people at ease and eliminate some of that fear uh, that they may have uh, going into this. So I think, Part of that, and I think it might be a natural byproduct of this environment where, you know, we have a lot of uncertainty, you know, things are more dynamic and you also have, you know, channels of communication that may be outside of your control. So from your perspectives, what are things that organizations can do to kind of mitigate the risk associated with misinformation or bad channels of communication kind of out there with information that may not be accurate? I think that comes back to some basic communication foundations, the uh, best practices of feedback. You know, as I stated earlier, um, you know, having that clear path so that people can, you have that two-way communication enabled, but we need that feedback. We need to ensure that people are understanding. And I, I think with what Dennis said, that's where a lot of that training comes into place. We, we cannot assume that, um, the message is being received correctly. We need to, um, you know, engage in feedback. And we also need to really listen to our employees. We need to listen to them to understand what are those fears, as Dennis mentioned, what, what are they? So we need to listen. We need to really be great communicators and search for that and seek that feedback. And we need to listen to our employees and to other stakeholders so that we understand what their fears are and again, provide that two-way communication. Um, you know, some of the things that really helps and you may not think about it is basic signage uh, in the work environment. Signage that clearly indicates, um, here's where you can sanitize your hands, here's where you can wash your hands. You know, you walk in, put on your mask, maybe a sign of how do I wear a mask properly. Uh, a lot of that, you know, and even those type of um, possibly online training programs for proper hygiene, uh, we, we really need to be on top of all of that. I also think that um, you're going to find that a lot of people are going to need accommodations and you're going to have to communicate how are they going to uh, accommodate individuals who may have health issues that uh, prevent them from uh, being in certain circumstances. So I think that they need to communicate, look, we're going to take care of you. This is what we can do to accommodate certain individuals or, and again, they, I think Sandy hit the nail right on the head with the management's got to, they got to listen. They got to hear, they got to like uh, begin to understand what some of the, they may not even have understood all the problems that are out there yet. I think this is also new that they're just going to have to, uh, do it on the fly. They're going to have to figure out a lot of different things on the fly because things are changing so quickly. And uh, we don't know where this is going to go, whether we're going to have another bob of 
uh, another episode of closure or uh, who knows we don't know what's going to happen yeah. but i think they need to uh make sure that people understand how they can accommodate them and so forth so let's shift. flexibility oh, i'm sorry um okay. flexibility is going to be key yes and i think that that really links into the accommodation we're going to see people applying for accommodation who have never even considered applying for accommodation before in their careers and we're going to have to be flexible in how we provide those accommodations because it's also going to be a new type of accommodation that organizations are not used to providing so flexibility is going to be key so as you guys are, are speaking about not only the importance of communication channels but you know thinking forward to operationalizing this this kind of new within this new agile environment where, where it's really dynamic and things may be changing day to day. From an administrative and operational perspective, what are the things that organizations should be doing to kind of keep things at least moving collectively forward? Hmm. I know that's a, little, that's a lot to ponder. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll narrow down maybe, it'll help you out a little bit maybe, you know, for example, you know, you know, work hours or, you know, how often should you be meeting? Should you be taking or requiring your employees to keep logs of their, of what they're doing? Um, even something as simple as storage, you know, are they storing files on their home computer or should we be thinking about maybe a cloud or a network service that people should be VPNing into uh, or even the social side of things? You know, is it okay to set meetings weekly and have your employees come just to talk or, you know, is that something that they should be doing? I think they need to start with evaluating the situation and see, like, I think it's important that if you have a workforce where not everybody has to be there, I wouldn't require them all to be there. Um, if some people can re work remote, you just leave them uh, continue working remotely uh, versus those who have to be on the online, on the you know, face to face with individuals. So I think the, the strategy has to, again, go back to what Sandy said, uh, has to be flexible. Um, I think they need to evaluate their circumstance, who needs to be there, who doesn't need to be there. And uh, I think they need to implement, um, again, a flexible uh, uh, work day, you know, so that individuals, some are working at home, some are there. Again, I I don't have all the answers uh, for sure, but they need to be looking at evaluating their circumstances overall. Well, I don't think any of us have all the answers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It would be nice if we did, yeah. but it, there isn't, as you're saying, there is not a one size fits all. Um, every organization is going to have to analyze the needs of their organization, their industry, and more importantly, the needs of their employees. And, you know, what do our employees need to efficiently perform their job in this new flexible environment? And once we determine that and do that type of an analysis, then we can determine, okay, what are the parameters and policies of, I've talked to some HR professionals who uh, their organizations are uh, more formalized and uh, both of us would not be permitted to do what we're doing right now because they have very rigid policies about approved backgrounds, attire during virtual meetings, but that fits their organizational culture. And it's actually not that different from what their organization requires on in-person meetings. So what they've done is they've taken that culture and they've continued it through with the teleworking environment. So, once again, everybody needs to look at their particular organization, their industry, and their workforce, and what's gonna best enable their workforce to work efficiently, regardless of whether that's at home or it's at the office. Yeah, and I think they need to consider um, what kind of training are they gonna put in place to make sure this is, uh, they're able to, um, able to do it. Um, for example, even with universities, we see they're training a lot of professors with online uh, teaching and so forth. And, uh, but I think they have to be more uh, how to creative on how they're going to accomplish uh, certain 
um, certain things because again, that flexibility comes into play. So I think training is a huge part. How do we, how do we accomplish this? How are we going? Because there's a lot of people that are not tech savvy. Um, they're not able to work from home. Uh, they're scared of it. Um, so again, I think training is a huge part of it as well. Do you we also even feel, go ahead, Sandy. I was just going to say we when we talk about indi not individual, not all individuals are um, comfortable working from home. When we start taking in that home environment as a workspace, you know, we have you know some individuals who you know they have children at home, or you have multiple people trying to work from home. So we we need to expand our work environment and realize that when people are working from home, that that environment has just completely changed. And you know, there's gonna be individual accommodations based on those people's you know, home environment. And there, and there needs to be some patience. I, have, I can tell you going from a uh, classroom to teaching on Zoom, um, I've noticed that like you have dogs barking coming into the picture, kids, and you, you gotta be, you gotta talk, be tolerant um, in some of these situations because again, they're at home. They can't just shut down their, their home environment. And, uh, so yeah, I think we, the, again, we get back to, I think that word flexibility just fits the whole, the whole package. And, uh, you know, we need to be patient with, uh, our employees or students, whatever the case may be, um, because things are different. And I don't think we're going to see this go away. Mm -hmm. Um, this is never going to go away. We're, I just was, was on a conversation yesterday and we were talking about, you know, the, the future of um, job analysis and job descriptions and hiring and recruiting, and it's going to change. Mm. Uh, we are, we are going to be looking for individuals who are flexible. Uh, we're going to start including training in technology and we're not going to be like, okay, the pandemic's over. Um, we're, we're just going to go back to the way it was that that's not going to happen. Things have changed and are going to continue to change. And like the training you mentioned, that it's a perfect example. You're going to see training changing in organizations moving forward. You know, maybe originally we didn't train in virtual meetings. We're going to start training in virtual meetings. We're going to start training on professional presence in virtual meetings. Uh, and we're going to really analyze our jobs and the job descriptions and the type of people that we're looking to fulfill those jobs. Uh, we're, we're, it's going to change everything. It really is. I just wonder how many of the administrators are looking and doing analysis that say, you know what, uh, we're finding out that uh, this new model, we're, being, we're more efficient, we're more effective, it's more cost effective. Um, we don't need all this brick and mortar as we thought we did. Um, so I think the mindsets of uh, many of the administrators or leadership has uh, also changed on how they want to proceed in the future. It doesn't even relate to the pandemic. Maybe they're just saying, hey, we're, we're much better off doing it this way. Um, so again, it's just the, I think the um, culture is changing and uh, we're going to see a totally different uh, model for business. Oh, I completely agree with that statement. That's, I really do. I agree with that statement. It is going to change. Um, and, and it's, you know, change is not a bad thing. Change is actually a really a, a good event in organizations. It's a, a continuous event in organizations. Um, and it, it's going to be better for, I think, a lot of the generations in the workforce nowadays, because organizations are going to come out of this on the other side and they are going to be more flexible and they're going to look at new business models. And I think that's more consistent with the generations entering the workforce. They want that flexibility. So, you know, it's hard to sit here and say that something great's coming out of COVID-19, but there are going to be positive changes that will come out of this. Yeah, I agree. How quickly do you guys think organizations will do that after action review and begin to make changes within their organization based upon kind of the way that they were forced to operate. Hmm. I think immediately, I don't think yeah. they have a choice. Um, and again, um, I, I think there's a margin there that's so thin that uh, they have to react quack or quick quack. Sorry about that. <laughs> 
I didn't have enough coffee yet today, but um, they didn't act, or if they don't act quick enough, again, they may not have a business. So I think the turnaround is going to have to be uh, very rapid. What yeah, I, I think that change is beginning already. I, I do. I think that change, I keep talking over you. I apologize. Right. But I think that change is, we're seeing that change. Um, I've talked to a, a number of businesses that they're amazed at how more efficiently people are working at home. And once again, it's unique to industries. It's unique to every organization. It's different. But, you know, um, I was talking to an individual and they felt that they had really made the transition quickly because the company's very flexible. But the first thing that came to their mind was we were lucky that the pandemic hit us in this particular way, this particular manner, because our flexibility and they already did a lot of um, working from home. So they were able to just accommodate very easily. But the first thing on their mind was another pandemic may impact us in a different way. We now really need, let's take the time now to analyze our processes and see, you know, expand that flexibility into different um, arenas. So I think that change is taking place already. And I think organizations also are looking at how do we start, and, and this is a big part of HR, is how do we start tracking these uh, specifics like people working at home? How do we track their hours? How do we track and make sure that they're completing uh, all their tasks and so forth? So that'll become a new process as well. So again, we're going to see a whole new innovation of how to, uh, how to monitor, how to track, how to complete um, again, I think it's all new. So as you guys have discussed this kind of this new model or the new way that organizations are going to kind of reshape themselves post COVID, um, again, understanding it may research, but we have to keep operating. You know, what are the leadership characteristics? And you guys talked a little bit about uh, new hires or employees, but also from an organizational standpoint in terms of either managers or leaders, what, what type of characteristics are going to emerge as new things that organizations need in place in order to have really good leadership? Well, wow. Um, good question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I think that I, there's a different type of leadership out there. Again, um, there's a virtual uh, type of leadership that we need to start looking into. A lot of leaders uh, maybe do not understand how to lead virtually. Um, so I think that as we're, we've been talking today, we see that uh, organizations are becoming more virtual and leaders are gonna have to adjust to that and learn how to lead individuals virtually. Um, I don't, it sounds simple, but it's not as simple as some would think. So again, there has to be that presence. How, like Sandy said earlier, how do you, how do you communicate uh, your goals or your missions and, and so forth or manage individuals virtually? So again, I think that's something they're gonna have to adjust to. Yeah, I think we're gonna see leaders who, obviously they're gonna need to communicate well, be flexible. Um, they're gonna have to be very inclusive of their workforce because everyone's going to have unique working styles from home. Every position is going to work differently from home. So I think we're going to see the leaders that are successful are going to be more open um, and more inclusive to, you know, individuality. Um, th those are really the people that, you know, they're not going to be afraid of change. Um, they're going to welcome different communication styles, different working styles. Um, I, I think they're just going to have to trust their employees more. That, that sounds pretty simple, but I, I think trust is going to be a key element. And I think that Sandy brings up a great point. One of the issues that uh, if you if you read a lot of research, change is one of the hardest things that uh, that individuals deal with. And I think that, again, that's probably something where they're going to have to open up and be more flexible in in accepting change and realize that change is inevitable. Um, so again, that's an area of, that's a tough area to, for some leaders. How should organizations become more aware of rising like anxiety and stress caused by, you know, the new environment and all the change that's happening right now within the employee base? 
Oh, absolutely. They they need to be, they really need to know their employees and be accepting of that. Everyone's going to respond to, you know, what's the, you know, COVID-19, any type of um, social situation, they're going to respond to it differently. And you need to under, you need to know your employees. You know, one of the things I always talk about is that I have this one lecture that I do. And at the very last slide is know your employees in these huge letters, because it, I mean, that's really what it, is is managers and leaders need to know their employees because everyone is an individual and you need to respect that and everyone's going to require a little bit different type of communication style working style you have to have a different relationship with everyone i totally agree um I don't have much more to say on that one, Patrick. Sandy <laughs> covered it all. <laughs> it's all good. So the last question I think I have for you guys is, as you think of work-life balance, right? I mean, before the more traditional setting, pre-COVID, you know, I was always trying to figure out how, you know, you can, I don't know, maximize vacation time or think about hobbies and, and making sure that, you know, you have time away from work. But now that they've sort of become almost blended with a lot of individuals working from home, what, what are your tips for getting work-life balance and making sure that, again, you know, you're not necessarily sitting on email, you know, 15, 16 hours a day, you know, without thinking about taking a break or maybe spending time with family or kids or a hobby now that, now that you're home more, perhaps. I think leadership has a strong role there. Mm -hmm. Um, some people are very good with managing their time when they work from home. Others will work 24 seven and leadership needs to really lead by example and, you know, do not communicate, you know, after five on weekends, something like that. Um, make sure that your employees are, you know, taking those breaks if the employee feels a lot of pressure that, you know, you know, sort of like, you know, big brother corporate is watching everything I'm doing and monitoring every keystroke, then the person's going to feel a lot of pressure. So, I mean, leadership really needs to step up and lead by example. And they also need, you know, maybe it would help to actually develop clear policies that, you know, maybe we have a meeting once a week and you're expected to be at that meeting set your goals and deadlines, but you, you also check in with your employees. Hey, how was your weekend? You know, um, if you know your employees, you're going to know if they went camping for the weekend or if they have kids who are in softball games or something like that, you know, let your employees know that it's important for them to have a life outside that computer screen and working from home. I think they're going to have to, provide training um in some areas like time management um i think would be important i think uh how to i mean just discipline the discipline and then what i mean by discipline not necessarily discipline themselves to complete their work but also discipline themselves to be able to put the work down walk away from it um because i know as a manager in the past that i mean now i'm showing my age i was carrying a blackberry and and uh all this stuff and and you were 24 7 people were contacting you and you had to learn finally learn to say look at a certain time i'm done i i'm my family is important to, important to me and i think that that's part of the training too we need to see they need to understand uh the stresses again we go back to what sandy was saying everybody's an individual some people can work longer some people can't um it depends on the individual so I, I guess it would just be training them to be able to be aware of their limitations and management needs to learn that there are going to be limitations as well um some individuals will not be able to do as much as other individuals um like sandy said some will work 24 7 but uh and they can handle it but again i think that uh there needs to be training out there and i and then i can't I agree with Sandy. I can't stress enough that uh, knowing the individuals and knowing what their limitations are really helps as well. So I think I broke rule number one in inviting you guys to the podcast late via text as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'll have to go back and be more cognizant of when I'm texting people and, and pushing them into doing stuff that on a July 3rd when they should be enjoying their camps and vacations, right? 
I'm enjoying mine. <laughs> Good. So do you guys have any final thoughts or advice, you know, collectively as you kind of reflect on, you know, what we've experienced thus far, uh, just for, like you said, anybody who's going to be listening to this webinar? That's Go not... <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to put Sandy on the spot first. Huh? <laughs> um, I guess I think just picking from pulling from some of the things I said, we really need to respect individuality in this situation. And we, as hard as it is, sometimes we also need to look at what we're all experiencing and find the learning opportunities and move forward. So, you know, I, I come out of this with, you know, I need to respect the fact that everyone is experiencing this in a different way. It has a different impact on everyone's life. So I need to respect everyone's individuality. And then I need to take out of this experience everything I can that's positive and move forward with those positive aspects. Yeah. And I Probably my piece of advice would be going back to that word, if we're choosing words, is that flexibility and how organizations need to be flexible during this time. Uh, but I think something we didn't talk about, employees got to be flexible as well. They got to be patient with their organizations because this is all new to them as well. So, you know, they may make some mistakes, um, you know, implementing new policies and procedures or uh, they move, may overlook something. And uh, again, that comes back to that communication part. But I would, I would just give advice to employees as well to be flexible and patient with their organization. Well, I want to thank both of you guys uh, for taking the time, especially on this holiday weekend, for sharing some insight. Uh, like you said, I know a lot of organizations are you know, doing the best they can and they're looking for resources uh, to help them guide their way forward. Uh, so again, thank you guys both for being here today. I really appreciate it. Yeah. yeah well, thank you for asking. Yeah, uh, thank you, Patrick. And what I will do is I will provide you guys the contact information and kind of profiles for both uh, Professor Murbosch and Professor Ferkatich in our show notes. Uh, so if you're an organization, like you said they're always willing to provide you know some insight if you reach out to them. Uh, they're pretty quick in terms of responding as well. So we are appreciative of that. So everybody and our listeners, thank you so much for tuning in today. And we look forward to seeing all of you guys again on a future episode. And as always, if you guys have any questions, comments, or concerns, keep sending them our way. We read them and we will respond and 